quantum computing is based on the system of quantum mechanics. In quantum computing, we perform operations over qubits instead of bits. A qubit is a vector which can take on many more values than 0 or 1. The technology used to implement quantum computers is advancing such that it has its own Moore's Law, but it can also leverage the classical advancements of Moore's Law. If classical computing advances at the exponential pace of 2 to the n, quantum computing advances at the pace of 2 to the 2 to the n. Quantum computing will advance technologies in ways that will take us by surprise. If things feel like they are moving fast now, just wait until developers have access to quantum processing units. Machine learning, simulated chemical synthesis, and NP-complete problems are ripe for quantum computers. VJ Pandey is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz and a board member at Rigetti Computing, a quantum computer company. In this episode, we explored what software engineers today need to know about quantum computers and some of the application domains that developers will be working on as quantum computers become available. I enjoyed this episode. I certainly plan to do many more shows on quantum computing because I barely understand it. Developers love Heroku. It's the fastest way to deploy an application on scalable infrastructure. I know this from experience, as I have built more software products on Heroku than I can remember. When a project I am building with Heroku starts to get more serious, I use Heroku Flow. Together with Heroku CI, Heroku Flow is a full continuous delivery solution for Heroku. With Heroku Flow, a push to GitHub spins up an instance of my application called a review app. I can test the new instance, the review app, and discuss it with my team. And if it works, I can approve the changes and push it to master, where the tests will run through Heroku CI before being pushed to production. Heroku Flow brings the developer experience of Heroku together with continuous delivery. Check it out now at heroku.com slash flow. You can also check out the interview that we did with Andy Appleton from Heroku about Heroku Flow and continuous delivery. And if you want to try a simple platform for deploying scalable apps with continuous delivery, Check out Heroku Flow at heroku.com slash flow. Vijay Pandey is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Vijay, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hi, uh, great to be here. So today we're going to talk about quantum computing. And I want to start off by giving some people a soft introduction because I don't think we can make too many assumptions about the audience. What do software engineers who don't have any background in physics need to know in order to understand quantum computing? Yeah, so quantum computing is a fundamentally different paradigm. I mean, you think about like the paradigm shifts we've had to deal with, like going from like a, a regular, you know, von Neumann CPU to let's say message passing or threads or even GPUs or TPUs. Each one of those are major changes where you have to take algorithms, and I think usually the secret to success in those generational shifts is not just taking the exact same algorithm, but really rethinking the algorithm, at times rethinking the problem. And in doing so, that's how you really can make huge gains. You know, with, with in my case, with Folding at Home, the distribution competing project that I led at Stanford, you know, we had to really completely rethink the, the algorithm because we went from running on massively parallel HPC high performance computing to, you know, millions of computers connected by the internet. So it's a, a very different type of paradigm. Here, it's different still. Because, you know, if we call it quantum computing, I think to really reset your thinking about this, what is really happening is more like a quantum experiment that like a physics experiment that's being run that you can automate and set up and take advantage of much like, I don't know if, if any of you have ever sort of seen analog computing and the idea is there that it's sort of just physics is doing the calculation. And the question is how can you be clever enough to take advantage of this? And the beauty unlike analog computing is that so much of the paradigms for regular computing come over but if you start thinking about this as a quantum experiment, it will sort of set your expectations for how different this will be and for you know the fun and the challenge of doing this completely different type of computing. When you say analog computing, are you talking about 
when you go from doing computing where at the lowest level it's represented by zeros and ones to a place where you can represent a range of values for every slot that would previously have been represented as a zero or a one? Yeah, exactly. Like in analog computing, you could build electrical circuits that do addition and multiplication just by the laws of physics of you know circuits. And you're not having a multiplier or an adder in terms of digital stuff. But you know, you, analog computing just doesn't scale. And so it's a very different type of beast. But it's, a, it's, it's in that sense, yeah, it's like you're not using zeros and ones, you're, you're using something else. Hmm. So when I talked to your partner, Chris Dixon, we were discussing a little bit about this quantum computing stuff, and he suggested that a logical language other than Boolean algebra might soon become useful. Like a lot of our computation is based on Boolean algebra right now because at the lowest level we're, we're doing stuff with ones and zeros. And, you know, there was some transistor technology, I think, a long time ago that you could have three different, it was ternary logic, you could have zero, one, or two, because at the lowest level, transistors, well, the abstraction that I understand, transistors are, they operate off of either a high voltage state or a low voltage state, and that's the one or the zero, but you could, you know, that those are just, those are ranges that are just, you know, fabricated, and you could just say, okay, now you have a low, medium, and high voltage and then you could essentially have a wider language of expressivity at the, you know with our current model do you have any thoughts on that history or do, do you have any perspective on on those experiments in the non-binary transistor space of the past yeah there therein i think there's this really interesting situation where i would tie it into moore's law in general which is that you know, so Moore's law has died so many times, right? So the first death of Moore's law is, well, we can't make, you know, individual processor cores much faster. So we're going to have to have more processor cores. And some people felt that was the death of Moore's law. But if you think about Moore's law as just doubling the number of transistors, Moore's law hasn't died at all. I mean, we're still getting smaller and smaller transistors. Everything's just moving along. So no death there. And then the next thing we'll say is, well, eventually, and actually, it's amazing how far we've come, like in terms of, you know, just how many few nanometers with these transistors are, but eventually, transistors can't be smaller than atoms. And we're getting close to that. So in a few generations, you know, 10, 20 years, or probably more like 20, we will get to this physical limit. And then there will be the people will say, well, then Moore's law, of course, is dead. But then there's going to be three dimensional transistors and that will allow increasing of transistors. And then I suspect that there will be tricks along lines of what you're talking about that continue to extend our compute power. So your transistors can get smaller, but they could get more capable. So if you could handle, you know, four things instead of two, like zeros and ones, you have zero, one, two, three. Obviously, that would be a tremendous addition. Also, I think given all the excitement about deep learning and neural nets, it seems natural for a revival of analog computing coming in where instead of dealing with these 8-bit floats like you would on a modern GPU or TPU or so on, you know, an analog computer, a computing would easily be able to handle that with the precision you need and do it with many fewer transistors and fewer FPUs and all these things. And so mm -hmm. I think this is, there's going to be a, a really interesting trend that computer engineers have been so resourceful that resourcefulness, I think, is not going to end for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I want to give people more color on this analog computing. And I think what you mean by that is that, so the notion of quantum computing is going from bits, which are ones and zeros, to qubits, which are basically vectors. So a qubit represents a vector rather than an on or off state. So we have a wider range of values that can be represented in the same space that previously, in the previous paradigm, might have been represented with a zero or a one. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so that's true of quantum computing. I think that's not necessarily a thing most people lead with in quantum computing because the really cool thing is a superposition, which I'm sure we'll get to, on the fact that you can do all these calculations in parallel. But that is a nice extra twist that you get a more bang for your buck even per qubit versus per regular bit. Hmm. Okay, talk about superposition. Yeah, so, so this is the sort of kind of a crazy and exciting thing about quantum computing, the heart of it. The heart of it is that if you have, let's say, n bits, like, you know, let's just say 32-bit quantum computer, which is a relatively small one and compared to the designs that people have been throwing around, what you can do is that you can do calculations that do operate on all 32 bits simultaneously. So let's say you need to search through something that had a space of 32 bits. So the number of possibilities is 2 to the 32 power you know, something is, which is about roughly about 4 billion, instead of having to just cycle through each one of them 
the quantum computer in principle can do that in one operation instead of two to the 32 operations. And so to make analogs to regular computing, the clock speed of a quantum computer is going to be a lot slower, but the number of operations that you can do per tick is dramatic. And the real kicker is this, is that so with n bits, you know, you can do two to the n. So now the question is like, well, how many bits are we going to have? And the answer right now is what people have published is like, you know, eight bits, but people are talking about 32 bits and 64 bits coming relatively soon. So the question now is, well, how is this number of bits going to change? And with the technologies that people are using right now, which is just, you know, bootstrapping on top of silk and chips and so on, the number of qubits increases like Moore's law. So let's to keep the math simple, like roughly doubling every year. And so if you had like eight now, next year it'd be 16, then 32, then 64 and so on. But the power of the quantum computer scales like two to the number of qubits. So this quantum Moore's law is kind of mind blowing in that the number of qubits goes like two to the n, where n is like say a number of years from now. The power of the machine is two to the number of qubits. So it's two to the two to the n. And hmm. this is going to catch people by surprise because we're used to the cadence of Moore's law, which is just two to the n. And we're used to speed ups and like, you know, you get a thousand times over 10 years roughly or something like that. This is something where quantum computing at first will seem like a toy. You'll say like 32 qubits, I can't, I, my, my GPU can beat that easily. And then 64 qubits, my GPU can beat that easily. But, you know, 120, 256, maybe it's 200 qubits, that's the killer. You go from 120 to 256 in one generation, suddenly the quantum computer goes from a toy to devastating. So Moore's law, you know, is, is not exactly a scientific law. It's more like we had a bunch of, or I think, you know, Gordon Moore just kind of like looked into the past and he's like, okay, here's kind of some evidence that, you know, the trends are going to work this way. And then he sort of stated it. And then whether it was just a, a fact of human nature, this is how human nature advances, or if it was the fact that by codifying it into what he called a law, he kind of encouraged the market to all operate in lockstep. And they did all operate in lockstep, which made the market operate against Moore's law. But, it's, but it wasn't exactly a law of nature. If I remember correctly. So is this the same case with the 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 qubit relation to Moore's law that you're explaining, or is there actually like a scientific basis for why we would get those kinds of gains over time? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that this is more an observation and a power of human will. In the quantum case, we are already just bootstrapping off of existing silicon technology so that you don't actually have to do anything all that new. The size of the gates and so on are huge compared to transistors. So that part is kind of already seems to be guaranteed in terms of just the number of gates. And so the good news there is that that's not something that has to be proven out necessarily. You have to do other things. You have to keep these gates to have this co sense of coherence, which itself is a challenge. But that's not a challenge in sort of silicon process engineering necessarily. The part, though, that is, you know, just fun to think about is like, why is Moore's law? Why has Moore's law been a sort of an empirical fact? Let's call it a, take it away from a law an empirical fact over so many decades. And part of it is a testament to human will and engineering and market forces and so on. But a part of it is that there are just certain technologies that have this capability of exponential increase that every, you know, if you can just make something like some percent better of its original. So, you know, if you can make it 10% better or 50% better, that alone gets you to exponential, you know, that's just math. You know, if something increases in capability by a fraction of itself. And there are a lot of technologies that work this way. Computers work this way. Actually, things that have nothing to do with computers work this way. So genome sequencing, the cost of genome sequencing was going down like Moore's law until it stopped. And actually, it stopped because it's now going faster than Moore's law. So it's, it's a testament to the fact that often things can get better by a fraction of it rather than just adding something. Like if your bank account increased by 30% every year, your bank account would grow exponentially. If your bank account increased by $30 a year, it would grow linearly. And it's that kind of math where something can increase by a fraction of its existing capability is what makes this possible. Hmm. Now, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this topic despite doing a, a fair amount of research on it. And I'm trying to figure out to what degree I can draw a mapping between traditional compute, well, con computing as I've known it since I kind of started looking into programming and computer science and quantum computing. And so I'm trying to figure out where the analogies break down and, and where they're supported. So if every qubit is a vector, it has a range of, it has a wide range of values, instead of a logical 
zero or one, like a bit, can we put the entire value of an opcode into a single qubit? Because the idea of an opcode is, you know, this kind of this in, this instruction. Is that an analogy that would make sense? Yeah, kind of. I think the qubits are more like the registers. And so you, ah, don't, okay. you don't put an opcode into a register, obviously. You have something else that's reading the instructions and then operating on your registers. So this would be like almost like your accumulator in a, in a CPU. So if you think of it that way... It's a lot like another accelerator. Like, you know, there was, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, the first computers I programmed didn't even have FPUs, right? They, you had to have this separate chip, like an 8087, as your FPU. And, and, and it, it, it works seamlessly. But then things like GPUs and so on are not nearly as seamless. This is something else where it's just sitting connected to your computer. And I think the future of things, at least for a while, are going to be these hybrid machines. Where, like you have a GPU on your classical computer, you'll have a QPU on your classical computer. You're going to offload stuff to it. The qubits are your accumulator. And then you send instructions that are the opcodes that operate on these qubits. And so doing various physics things on it, but it's the equivalent of op- going through opcodes. Your enterprise wants to adopt containers, but you aren't sure how. CoreOS will help you along your journey to a containerized architecture. CoreOS are the container experts trusted by Salesforce, eBay, Ticketmaster, and other world-class organizations. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash coreos to find our top five episodes about containers and Kubernetes, as well as a white paper about migrating an enterprise to Kubernetes with CoreOS. They've hosted, attended, and spoken at many shows about containers and Kubernetes because those technologies are the future of the web. That's why CoreOS built Tectonic, an enterprise-ready Kubernetes platform. At softwareengineeringdaily.com slash coreos, you can learn about how containers can make your organization run more efficiently. Thanks to CoreOS for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. So the things that make sense to offload to the quantum processor on your computer, what are those going to be? Yeah, so anything where your algorithm really can be massively scaled by doing a lot of things in parallel, So anything right now that's MP complete that fits in the number of qubits, that's like the first off no brainer. If you had an order N algorithm, it's generally probably not the case that a quantum computer will speed it up much. But order N algorithms are are rare and already quite fast. And probably the same for even an N log N. If you have an N log N algorithm, I I doubt it will be all that useful for anything either exponential. Exponential is where the obvious wins are. And we tend to, you know, the funny thing is we tend to, as a programmer, you will just not even think about exponential algorithms because that would be the dumb solution usually to things. But there are certain problems we just can't even tackle because we just reject anything that's MP complete as being just unscalable. What this does is it opens the door to MP complete being the standard way to approach a lot of things. And to, to, uh, so that's the easy one. But, you know, things, you don't have to be uncomple- MP complete to be a pain in the ass. You could be N to the eighth or into the sixth. And that still is bad enough at large enough end that this is worth doing. But that's, I think, a good place to start. And there are many types of algorithms that uh, people have been proposing that are classic computer science algorithms that would be interesting to bring over in machine learning and cryptography and all these things. But, you know, and, and we can talk about this more in depth, but I think a lot of the first things that will come about will be to use quantum computing to calculate quantum mechanics, which is itself, if you do it right, is MP complete and a mess, and this thing could just do it naturally because it, it's quantum in its very own nature. And why wouldn't we just have the the QPU replace all of our processors? Because you know all this, you know all the computation that I, I work with, like you know, I, I go onto my Twitter feed or I open up Searchlight on my Mac, and the recommendations that these systems provide to me. They're great, but I'm sure they would be better if they were, if you know, if they were kind of going in with the assumption that knapsack was solvable or that you know best best match or you know all these all these different NP complete problems that you learn about in in your algorithms courses. Like why? So why wouldn't QPUs replace everything? Yeah, you know, I think if you think about modern computing, 
It's typically going to be a mashup of many different types of devices. You know, just take a look at a phone. A phone is a regular CPU and a GPU, sometimes a DSP, all these different things thrown together. For the phones, it's obvious that you'd want to do this because of just power consumption. That's going to handle that. But, you know, another, even if power was an issue, there's reasons why our laptops or our desktops have CPUs and GPUs. There's just some things CPUs will always do better. And so there's that. But then finally, on top of that, you know, when I said this is a physics experiment, a quantum experiment, these things are hardcore, at least at the moment. They are run at four millikelvin, you know, so, you know, like one Kelvin is already pretty freaking cold. You know, like, you know, where, you know, freezing is 273 Kelvin. What four millikelvin is, you know, you need liquid helium for, you know, liquid nitrogen, which, you know, is about as cold as most people ever see, like is 73, 77 Kelvin. So it's something where this is not something you'd have in your garage, like a four millikelvin <laughs> fridge. You know, it's something akin to the early days of a cray where, you know, you would have it somewhere safe. But nowadays, maybe the better analogy is a cloud. You know, you typically right. would have racks of cloud servers in your garage. You could, but the heating and cooling would be ridiculous. And it, why would you bother? And so similarly, quantum cloud is just obvious given how we do computing today and would naturally slide into that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so, uh, you know, there's another another show I did with your partner, Peter Levine. We, we talked about the this, you know, idea that he kind of talked about where, you know, you get the cloud moves to the edge yep. because of cars and drones. So I wonder if, you know, to decrease latency, you could have a, a like a drone that manages to have the right like temperature properties floating around. So you have lower latency to hit the drone and get the answer to your to your NP complete problem. Yep. Well, you know, the one thing, so Peter's very prescient in his observation there. But, you know, I think something that we've all seen is this back and forth you know, people had mainframes, then many computers allowed departments to have their own VAXs. So you didn't have to share the, you know, the government, the, sorry, the company mainframe or the, let's sort of the university mainframe. Everyone had their VAXs, but then, you know, they became centralized. So people got workstations and they became, and so on. There's this back and forth of centralization, decentralization that I've seen over and over and over again. Uh, you know, this cycles maybe are 15 years or something like that. So right now the cloud is is king, and I think Peter is most likely. I think I bet he's spot on with that. The edge is, is coming up, especially for power and latency, all these things. But I, I think it seems pretty safe to say the pendulum will eventually swing back because you just won't have a quantum processor on your drone as you talk about, <laughs> yeah. and, and or at least not for a while. That will open up interesting possibilities. But you know, actually, I'll, I'll just leave it one thing, which is cute. I I forget the temperature in space. It's pretty cold <laughs> space. You know, I, I think the cosmic uh, microwave background, oh. you know, something on that order. Four millikelvin might be still a little warm for space. I should, we should Google this right now. But, you know, there'll be really interesting applications in other places. So maybe not on your drone, but on your satellite is not crazy. Ah, interesting. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit more about how to build a quantum computer. Can you just give an overview for what the necessities are to, to i mean obviously okay you talked about cold temperature but just give me an overview of what components go into a quantum computer yeah so you know quantum computing has the idea of it's been around for multiple decades i remember as a grad student i was at mit that's when shor's lemma came out and everyone got excited this was like early 90s and so you know that's a long time ago so the problem has been how to build this coherent quantum computer with multiple qubits. And so this process of where you can sort of do two to the n only works when these qubits are coherent, where they're in one quantum state. And, you know, there are machines that have lots of qubits, but they are not fully coherent. And so the challenge in building this is how can you build it such that the coherence isn't lost and it always will get eventually lost, but it isn't lost so long that you can't do some calculations while still coherent. So this requires, you know, the successful teams, I think, will have a full stack approach where it's not just the quantum software engineers and not just like the chip designers. It's the fridge. It's getting signals in and out of the quantum computer. It's building the interface between the class computer and the quantum computer. It's understanding the process engineering. It's making the chips. That full stack approach is going to be more relevant here than other places. Although, you know, if you look at how Apple built the iPhone, they are from chips to, you know, to UI. And so that's not unprecedented. But I think this is a place where it may be really critical. How are the different corporate players like Google and IBM and Rigetti, who you just invested in, how are these different players attacking the problem differently? 
Yeah. So, and, and just for disclosure, so I'm on the, the, the board directors for Rigetti. We invest in them. And so Rigetti is a startup. Google and, and Microsoft uh, used to be startups. They are certainly no longer startups. And IBM as well are all in this mix. And it's very exciting and heartening that, that these A plus players view this space as being so critically important. I think it reflects that this is a special time. We'll see lots of different approaches. So if you look at what uh, Microsoft has publicly talked about what they're doing, they have you know uh, emphasis on software and in- some interesting ideas on hardware. IBM and Google have been pushing hardware and, and will do software. And Rigetti really wants to do this full stack approach where they go all the way from chips through computers, through software. The full stack approach with rapid iteration, especially rapid iteration that can in some ways be best facilitated by a startup, I think will have huge advantages. You know, it's still hard to do things in startups. Startups are amongst the hardest companies to, to build and run and so on. So it's not going to be without challenges. And so I suspect there'll be pros and cons of each approach. And then finally, much like computers, it's not like the world was dominated by one computer maker. And I think there will be many different players in this ecosystem as it evolves. And especially maybe the biggest difference is that in computers, you had primarily one architecture, like the 8086 versus the 6502 versus, you know, the uh, Z80, you know, they had different instruction sets, but like they weren't radically different in terms of the thought process for programming them. It was just how many registers did you have, how many bits and so on. These things will be a bit more different. And so having the diversity of players will be super interesting to see how this all shakes out and to see which designs are most flexible versus most parsimonious and cost efficient. Uh, There'll be probably certain applications that will need one type of machine versus another type of machine. With all these players involved, it seems guaranteed that something great will happen. I think it still remains to be seen how it all shakes out. Is there a good answer to the why now question? Has something changed in supply chain economics or scientific discovery that has made quantum computers now buildable, despite the fact that we've known that this technology could exist or could be buildable for a while? Yeah, I think there's several things. And this is, by the way, the the hardest thing to get right. And so it may not be now, but I'll give you the evidence for the case for why it it, it could be now. Part of what the key shifts that we always look for is shifts for something going from science to engineering. You know, you can't schedule science. You can't, like Einstein didn't have on his calendar, you know, today I'll come up with relativity. You don't have a roadmap for, for these things. It's a very different type of skill. It's about discovery. It's about creativity and so on. With engineering, you know, it's not guaranteed. It's extremely difficult and, and has its engineering has its own issues. Engineering is a little much more roadmappable and is something where we know how to scale engineering in ways that you just can't even scale science. And so at the heart of the shift that we're seeing now is this shift from science to engineering and especially engineering that can take advantage of process advantages in other spaces, like the fact that you can bootstrap on top of what people do for building chips, that's a pretty dramatic thing. And so a combination of things like that, where the challenges are engineering challenges, building on technologies which are already fairly established, doesn't mean it's guaranteed by any means, but it certainly changes the style from like, fingers crossed, maybe we'll figure out something scientifically to we have to engineer something the way we've engineered other things in the past. Not everything works, but it's, it's a different game. Hmm. I don't know how much... Rigetti has talked about this publicly, but are there any strategies that you've seen for how the company is aligning itself management-wise, or is it is it finding out like what kinds of teams they need? What it like? Do we need a software testing system? Do we need? Or, I don't know. Like, what is or or is it is it just like you know building Intel, for example? Are there historical analogs that you can look at for how to construct the team and how to manage engineering? Yeah, I think the the challenge there is that you have, you know, they're, with their full stack approach, they have to have a team doing fab, they have to have a team doing chips, they have to have a team building the computers, they have to have a team programming the infrastructure code, and then ideally, some people helping with examples and, you know, application code. So that full, full, full stack sense is a huge challenge from a management perspective. But that is the opportunity. You know, I mean, that's the sort of the intriguing part of it. The upside is that of doing this way, obviously, is that you can have advances that you come out on the software side influence how you design the architecture of the chips. And process engineering advances can affect how you build the chips and and so on. So, you know, all of these things is really sort of puts us in a, puts Rigetti in a very different place. 
and we'll see how all, uh, you know how it shakes out. That's one of the things that I was very excited about. Them. Hmm. They built Rigetti built this thing called Forest, which is a I think it's a tool for bridging the gap between classical computing and quantum computing. Explain what Forest is and why it's useful. Yeah, and so Forest is uh, is the name for a suite of different software tools. So there's Quill and PyQuill, which is the programming language. There's Grove, which is a repository. There's multiple parts in it. And so I think the the part that's especially important to start off with is Quill. You know, me loving Python, PyQuill is, is a very natural one. So the fact that you can program a quantum computer in Python, especially a quantum computer hybrid, and interface to everything else in Python, should hopefully facilitate the rapid development of new codes. And another key part of Forest is the quantum virtual machine. So, you know, you might not have access to a quantum computer right now. There are only a lucky few people on the planet that do. But, you know, everybody can have access to the QVM, can start coding right now for code that will run on a quantum computer. It, you know, it's a unique opportunity. You can imagine like the early days of homebrew computing with, you know, the first PCs and Bill Gates coming up with basic, you know, interpreters and, and operating systems and so on. He had to have the hardware in his hands to be able to program this. This is somewhere where, you know, the next kid, the next uh, quantum Bill Gates out there doesn't need, you know, to buy one or have his parents buy him one. This is something where you just need access to the software. You need a laptop and internet and you can start rolling. And so that's, I think, part of the real opportunity. And, and rolling for quantum computing will run on Rigetti, but in principle, you know, Quill can run on everything. It could run on any quantum computer. And so it's really an, it's opening the door into this new world. Do you think that's important to work on right now, like the the higher level interfaces for it? Because, you know, t- to me, I look at this and I'm like, it seems like if it's still so early, you know, why wouldn't you just kind of put all your chips on developing the hardware and the full stack? You know, isn't it like too early to to start developing the higher level interfaces? The higher level interfaces are going to be important because it's easy to do, unlike in the early days of um, processors. You know, we have it's easy to build something like PyQuil, and then the ability to abstract on top of it would really greatly facilitate the building applications. In this way, it's actually different than the early days of, of personal computing because there you didn't have all the infrastructure we already have to build on top of computing. You know, I think these, and also if you go back to the sort of what we're talking about in terms of how quantum computing will catch people by surprise, that, you know, at first it'll be ridiculously slow compared to the classical one. And then within one generation, it goes from ridiculously slow to, you know, killer application defeating all. Mm-hmm. With that in mind, you want to be programming this before, you know, that, that generational shift happens. And ideally, even starting to think about when those generation shifts happen, because it's not going to be the same for every application. For some applications, maybe like 200 qubits will be the, the, the point where we have a, what we would call quantum intercept, where, you know, the quantum computer would, would surpass the classical one. For some applications, it might be 1,000. For some, it might be 10,000. And understanding where that is is something that we want to figure out now. And the teams that get out ahead of this and have codes ready such for that next generation, they're the ones that are going to likely become the big winners rather than the ones that wait until the machine has passed quantum intercept and then start deciding it's time to learn about quantum computing. Mm-hmm. You have a background in biology, and you talked about your experience working on folding at home. What excites you about the intersection of biology and quantum computing? Yeah, so so this could be a podcast in its own right, and so I'll try to, keep, <laughs> uh, you know. And I, I should mention, by the way, that my you know my undergrad and graduate degrees are in physics. My first intellectual love is is, is an intersection between physics and computing. So in this sense, this is like right down the line for that. And then also, you know, um, my appointment at Stanford is in chemistry. So you know, something where I've spent a lot of time around chemistry and biology and physics. And that's where this gets very interesting because it's a, a beautiful synergy of all three. So it's a physics calculation. It's using quantum mechanics. And where I suspect the first applications will be is in the chemistry of biological molecules. And so, let, you know, I can unwrap that is that, so, you know, biological molecules do all these amazing things. You know, the most dramatic things they might do is act as enzymes. You know, enzymes catalyze reactions that things that on its own without the, the protein there, the enzyme uh, protein doing something it could literally take like a million years for this to just happen, you know, just by the laws of physics. But the protein can catalyze it such that this happens in seconds or milliseconds. 
And so that's a pretty amazing thing. And we would love to harness that type of power. And catalysts are used in engineering applications all over the place in chemical engineering. But it's very difficult to design enzymes the way evolution has and the way biology has. If we can simulate them, and especially simulate them with sufficient accuracy, because we can simulate them now, but the accuracy part's the, the kicker. Simulate them with sufficient accuracy, that's where we can actually start having a, a sense of rational design. Because we can't do that, so much of biology is done empirically. You know, like, so to, to make an analogy, like when we design a bridge, like the Bay Bridge here, that wasn't done empirically. People understand the physics of it. You can do calculations. You build a bridge, you know it's going to work. You know, my, my, my favorite analogy here is like if you build a bridge empirically the way you do most biological things like drugs, you know, build a whole mess of bridges. You build like a million bridges. Find the one you think works the best and then start doing empirical tests. Like you put mice on the bridge to see if the mice survive and you put people on the bridge and it goes in a sort of, if you think about the engineering versus empiricism, it's a radical shift. And so the ability of really start to engineer things that we can't do any other way because we just can't do the calculations, that would transform these industries. And, and that's what's at hand here. And the reason why it's possible with a quantum computer is that the most accurate calculations are, are MP-complete. It's not two to the n. It's actually n factorial, which is basically n to the n, you know, even worse. So, you know, that's the way to do the, the most accurate calculations. There are approximations people use, but those approximations have themselves huge limitations that are keeping us from using these things. So I think that could be probably one of the first applica killer applications, the ability to truly accurately engineer quantum devices, enzymes, you know, anything in that space. The process of troubleshooting bugs can be very tedious and inefficient for developers, especially as they are pushing more and more code to production. The unlucky developer assigned to troubleshooting bugs may get bombarded with error alerts and spend countless hours figuring out which errors to address first, digging through logs, and reaching out to other engineers. Bugsnag improves the task of troubleshooting errors and makes it a much more enjoyable and less time-consuming process. For example, when an error occurs, the application team can get notified via Slack, see all the diagnostic information related to the error, and identify the developer who committed that code. Bugsnag's integration with Jira and other collaboration tools makes it easy to assign and track bugs as they are being fixed. Try all features free for 14 days at bugsnag.com slash sedaily. Development teams can now iterate more quickly and improve software performance. To get started, go to bugsnag.com slash sedaily. Get up and running in three minutes. Airbnb, Lyft, and Shopify all use Bugsnag to monitor application errors. Try all features free for 14 days at bugsnag.com slash sedaily. This is something I don't completely understand. So, like, what I know about drug discovery is, you you know, if it comp computationally wise, you take a simulated environment of the human body sitting in a computer somewhere, and you do a bunch of like kind of guided brute force tests for how some compounds might bind to certain receptors and how that would affect the simulated human body that you have sitting in a in a computer. But part of the reason that these things are not super effective is because we don't understand the pathways in the human body well enough to actually have accurate simulation. So I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm just trying to understand how we can actually, you know, even if we have a massive increase in compute, how that's actually helpful if we don't have an accurate model that we're simulating against. Yeah. So first off, the designing of enzymes for, let's say, engineering applications and so on is very different than designing of drugs. They're okay. In terms of the empiricism, they're different in terms of the process for some of the reasons that you just, just talked about that, you know, biology is complicated, the body's calculated. When you run an enzyme, you're not doing it in a human body. You don't have to worry about toxicity mm. when you're using it to generate, you know, oh, okay. chemical and so on. That's done in some big vat and some industrial process. So you don't have to worry about all these other parts. So that's a key difference here. But a second one actually is that almost no drugs are designed with computation these days. I mean, or at least where the people involved in designing the drugs say that it would have been impossible without the computation. Computation plays a huge role, but it's not the star. It's much more of a support role. 
And this is shifting, and this is a whole other podcast to talk about, which is, let's say, machine learning <laughs> and drug design, which is a, something that you know I've worked on a lot, and then we've made investments in, and my, uh, you know I have tons of friends in this space. The compute and machine learning, engineering, and drug design, I think, is is shifting. It has some ways to go, and actually, this could be very helpful in that shift. That's almost like a very different type of game. Got it. Okay. Yeah, because because I guess the main issue is the unknown pathways, and you know, you're if if you're just designing an enzyme to do. I have no idea what what it, what an application would be. I'm making better steel or something. That's not something where you have to worry about the collateral damage of some other chemical pathway because it's not you no know, lives are going to be lost in yep. that kind of that yeah, kind of that's, trial. That, that's right. And and you know, I mean, without going too deep into this, there are some things where the pathways don't matter. Let's say if you come in with antibiotic, you just have to kill the bacteria. It's very easy for or relatively easy for drugs to kill. That's part of the reason why drugs are so toxic. Killing is easy. You know, antibiotics kill bacteria, but not humans. The, the not human part is the tricky part. It's a lot harder to cure Alzheimer's or to cure depression. That's where the pathways are complicated and the biology is complicated. There will be other ways to address that. And, but yeah, probably not by these. Mm-hmm. We did a show a while back about the storage potential of DNA. There were some people from Microsoft who were working on this. Have you looked into that topic at all? Yeah, so this I've been a huge fan of. I've looked into. We've seen some companies. We have not made investments in it yet. You know, DNA is kind of fun to think about as a storage medium. I don't know if you've ever used tape backups. You know, I've used them my whole <laughs> career, and you know, so tapes are pretty flaky. But apart from that, like if you have a tape backup that I would say is more than seven years old, the chance that you have the hardware to read it is pretty low. You know. I mean, frankly, like, I don't know if you have any cassette tapes on you or even like even now, I don't even know where I would play a a CD. I guess I have to go into my car to play a CD. You know, what's different about DNA is that for the foreseeable future, I cannot imagine a world where we are not able to read DNA because DNA is so important to human beings. Human beings would have to be into some sort of sci fi like beings of light like space, you know, before we stop caring about DNA. And even then, we maybe care about the DNA for the animals around us and so on. So the read part of DNA is universal. The storage density is tremendous. The bandwidth for reading DNA is increasing faster than Moore's Law. Writing is is coming up to speed. So all that is exciting. Intriguingly, you know, regular storage is also still moving like Moore's Law, too. It's a fun battle to see. I think what we suspect, I suspect you'll see is that the first applications for DNA storage will be for long-term storage storage where, you know, you want this to be around for 40 years or something like that, and you have a lot to store, and it goes sits in some minus, you know, a minus 80 fridge somewhere. And I could see that to start. I don't think it's going to be something where, you know, you have your backup USB drive will be, a, you know, a DNA drive. That might be a, quite a while. But for certain applications, I bet it's not that far off. What are the, like, enabling technologies that, you're, that you've got your eye on that would make this space work? Yeah, so, so the one key part of it is reading. And so Illumina and now, you know, Oxford and other people are having some really cool, uh, and Thermo Fisher have some very powerful technologies for reading. So reading looks like it's in good shape. Writing is also, there are several companies, several startups that are involved in writing and, and doing some exciting things there. The question is, when does those curves sort of catch up with the progress happening on backups. And I think the thing about backups is that you have to think about the total cost of backups. The fact that most backup systems, the tapes are actually in the facility after two years, even if you haven't messed with them, they're read back in and wrote to new tapes for preserving them. And that, and also that preserves for hardware generations and so on. So if you include all the costs of that, I think what I'm looking for is where the crossover makes DNA competitive. And I don't think we're we're there yet, but it's a battle between two very powerful technologies. And it's clear that the DNA one will win on density. And once that starts to become an issue, I think then we'll start to see, I think, a lot more uptake. Okay. You know, I want to talk a little bit about modern venture capital strategy, because I think as there's... More potential for these ideas that that for a long time, well, were just preposterous or insane. Now it's you know uh, I I did a show recently with Jeff Ralston who is a Y Combinator guy, and it was just like the idea that there's almost like nothing that is too preposterous to at least consider at this point. But these companies that are not just like SaaS companies, they're not just easy to understand consumer products. I think the the discussion of how and why 
to finance these is is kind of interesting. So how do you think about financing for a quantum computer company? This is a deep question, and there's a couple different ways to think about it. So first off is that in general, in investing in venture investing, our goal is to look for things that have world changing, you know, from investor point of view, high beta like returns. These are things that will typically have to be pushing the edge. On the other hand, we want to do things that are not going to be ridiculously capital intensive. So a company that can become, let's say, a $100 billion company, but needs $99 billion of investment, that's probably also not necessarily the best investment. So something where you think there's the hope, even if a fair bit of capital comes in, it's not going to be ridiculously capital intensive. And finally, hopefully there's an ecosystem of players that are interested in the space. So in quantum computing, certainly an ecosystem of players like IBM, Google, Microsoft Now, you know, would Facebook be interested? I mean, quantum machine learning could be very natural for them to want to be running in their own infrastructure. You know, for any of these big players, you know, even it's not crazy to think about Amazon and AWS wanting to, in time to have a quantum cloud. Any of these players could become interested. And so from a startup perspective, if you can really push powerful technology, you might IPO and partner with these guys. You might get bought by them. You, you know, there's lots of different possibilities. There just has to be the sense that there can be progress and ideally, you know, progress and monitor not just by scientific progress, but revenue along the way, such that you can build a big company the way some of the greatest tech companies have been built. Now, in venture stage investing, you're typically not ever investing with the goal of like a small aqua hire type of liquidity event. But, you know, there was this acquisition of DeepMind recently, and DeepMind got to a very strong financial position despite not having any product. The financial position that they got to was essentially based on this moat that they had of knowledge and talent, and it made it into just this incredible acquihire because there was so much upside in just the, the potential of the team. And I know this is not traditionally a way to make a venture investment, but do you at least think about that as protection against like some of the downside risk? Like because you know there's such a moat in terms of the intelligence of a quantum computer team that you know even in the event that there's some sort of issue in built and you know like building a fab or whatever else, you probably have some downside protection in in the fact that the company would get acquired for a ton of money. Does that factor into your the way that you invest at all? Yeah, I think you're spot on there in the sense that, A, you know, we don't invest with the intention for aqua hires. That's very much a, a plan B or C or D. What excites us is how this really could change the world and build a huge company. Well, you know, with that said, I, I think as an investor, if you can do a super high beta, invest in a super high beta company where there is downside protection, if you really genuinely believe on both sides of that, that becomes almost a no brainer for investing. You know, and part of that no-brainer, though, obviously has to be that this has to be this A-plus team and you know, all these other parts have to be there, but that that does help mitigate some of the financial concerns. Hmm. What do you think about the, the idea of basic science these days? Like, you know, it, so with the DeepMind example, again, is they're kind of doing something that looked like basic science. You know, they didn't really have an idea of what product they were going to build. They just took, kind of took some money and were like, okay, we're going to build general general artificial intelligence in 20 years. Is that a viable strategy if you're trying to start a company? Can you just say, like, look, I'm really good at this field. We're just going to do some basic science and kick the can down the road in terms of what product we're going to build. Are there enough things that look like basic science that have enough long-term upside that this is like a reasonable strategy? It's not a strategy that I would suggest. And I think there are, <laughs> you know, not that many examples beyond DeepMind, you know, that you can list. I think you know they had a fantastic team and have a fantastic team and 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 a very natural wire in Google that might be more of a perfect storm than something that is every day. Mm. Yeah, I mean in general your goal really should be to build something great not to build something acquirable, you know, or at least those are the things that we're looking for to invest. I mean, there's lots of ways to build companies and there's no right or wrong way to build a company, but in terms mm -hmm. of stuff that I am looking to invest in something that has the potential to to be the next Google, not necessarily just to be acquired by Google. What role do governments play in quantum computing? Yeah, This is where there are a lot of interesting applications, applications in cryptography. The quantum cryptography is a super rich area. So there are a lot of applications that naturally overlap with aspects that government usually takes care of for and, and handles. 
And so I think much like in other areas, I think, you know, we'll see governments and national labs being early customers of quantum computing broadly in, in, in many companies. And it's often that early adoption, you know, people forget about uh, DARPA and ARPA's role in the Internet. And we can go on and on and on. That can really help spur innovation that really then becomes consumer innovation later. I think there's all these different places. I think also one, one thing we'll see is to the extent that there's basic research that needs to be done, let's say in terms of algorithms or, or especially new types of algorithms, new types of computer science, much like there's new types of algorithms and new types of computer science being developed for regular computers too. That would be natural for the National Science Foundation and other governmental agencies to fund. So, you know, there's many different roles for government to play as a customer, as a funder, and I suspect we'll see all of that. Hmm. So if I'm a quantum computer programmer or want to be quantum computer programmer today, what do I do? Where do I start? And what are the kinds of applications that I might be incentivized to try to build on quantum computing infrastructure today? Yeah, so I, you know, a very natural place to start would be to go to the Rigetti homepage and, and, and check out Forest. I mean, because all that is just laid out for you. You know, there's the PyQuil is super easy to get started with. You can go through examples. It would feel I'm not sure what like right analogy is. It's like it's like learning scikit-learn, you know, or something like that. It's a it's another Python tool that can do you know really powerful things. And because it's Python, you can connect to everything else and connect to your existing code and so on. That would probably be the the natural thing. Then start playing with the Hello World equivalents, and then the the really that that will get you started. I mean, but that's obviously just the beginning. The next step is to really be thinking about what the opportunities are, what are the spaces to go after, what are the new algorithms to do, either from the point of view of a basic researcher or from the point of view of someone that wants to develop code in open source or from the point of view of someone who wants to develop a company. Okay, just to close off, I would love to know what's changing in your theses for biology investments, things at the intersection of biology and computer science with the, you know, we have all these changes going on like CRISPR, you know, there's obviously the, 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 all of the work going into neural interfaces, who knows how far along that stuff is, or maybe you know. Is there anything that's like changing really rapidly in, in how you think about these investments, like maybe how things have changed relative to where your thoughts were two years ago? You know, we started thinking internally about this intersection between biology and compute in, in 2015, and we launched our first bio fund at the end of 2015, and been investing in that. And you know, a lot of investing almost, you know, this is maybe a hackney analogy, but it has a, a deep analogy with surfing that if you're a little too far in front of the wave, you don't get to ride it. And if you're too far behind it, you don't get to ride it. Timing is very, very important. And I think we, we did well with timing of that fund and me coming on board and, and us really expanding the firm to really go big into this space. I think the, the next steps are realizing that machine learning and compute is part of a bigger picture. It's part of the picture that we referred to earlier about engineering versus empiricism. If you think about all the things that we love about tech investments versus, let's say, very, very traditional biotech investments, that tech investments can be capital efficient, can be uh, typically engineering versus empiricism, may not have a ton of regulation, although there's tons of things like Airbnb and Lyft that, that certainly have to be very thoughtful in working with regulators. You know, I think these are things that we attribute with the tech side of investing, and we're starting to see companies in biology and healthcare that are tech companies in all those ways and can be built up with small amounts of capital and so on. And you know, machine learning was a very natural place to start and, and a natural intersection. I think we're seeing more and more. I think one version of this is the fact that there's deep connections with, with biology in terms of reading and writing and, and coding biology. But I think this concept of engineering biology, the way we engineer circuits and computers, that's emerging. And I think that's going to be part of this bigger trend. You listed CRISPR. There's uh, you know, stem cells, we can list all these advances in biology that themselves, forgetting about any sort of computing engineering, themselves are super fascinating and exciting, but they really enhance and catalyze this perspective of how we can really push everything forward. Indeed. Well, VJ, thank you so much for coming on Software Engineering Daily. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, great talking to you too. Look for a job more efficiently with Indeed Prime. Indeed Prime flips the job search model and lets you find a job more efficiently even while you're busy with other engineering work or coding your side project. You simply upload your resume, and in one click, you get immediate exposure to companies like Facebook, Uber, and Dropbox. The employers that are interested will reach out to you within one week with salary, position, and equity up front. 
Don't let applying for jobs become a full-time job itself. With Indeed Prime, the jobs come to you. The average software developer gets five employer contacts and an average salary offer of $125,000 through Indeed Prime. It's 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now at Indeed.com slash SE Daily. Thank you to Indeed Prime for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to support the show while looking for a new job, go to Indeed.com slash SE Daily. Wow! 